This anime begins with a man leaving his house and getting ready for work. A student greeted him good morning, and shortly after, he checked his phone for news. Upon arriving at his office, he began working. The man's name and the protagonist of this story is Sasaki. He handled the company's tasks, and Sasaki tells us he has a regular job with a normal pay. Unlike other companies, his doesn't require overtime, although he needs more money to survive. He can't change jobs due to personal reasons. Sasaki continued his usual routine and entered a contest to win valuable prizes, but he didn't win. He returned home to the same student's welcome, and he thanked her for her kindness. The next morning, he visited a pet store and was surprised by the high prices of cats. Soon, he heard an animal speak and followed its voice, finding a java sparrow. It asked Sasaki to choose it as his pet. Upon seeing the animal and hearing its voice, Sasaki tried to contain his excitement, overwhelmed by its cuteness. Later, Sasaki returned home with the sparrow, which he bought with his savings, and placed it on his shelf. He tried to think of a name, and the sparrow introduced itself as Pircarlo, a wise being from another world. Sasaki didn't believe this, as he had read online that such birds don't usually speak. He decided to name the bird Pi. To test Pi's communication, he asked what it wanted for dinner. Pi responded that it wanted a Kobe beef steak. When asked why, Pi mentioned Yamada, the pet store owner, saying it's the best food in the world. Sasaki apologized to Pi, confessing he couldn't afford such expensive meat. Pai asked why he didn't seek more money. Surprised, Sasaki listened as Pai explained he left his world for a new life as a sparrow. Although he wondered how to return, he realized it wasn't crucial, as he was granted another life and wanted to live it as he wished. Pai offered Sasaki a deal. If he helped, Pai would ensure he never lacked money. Sasaki accepted, believing it to be a game. Suddenly, a magical seal appeared, granting Sasaki Pai's power. Pai asked to be released. Sasaki complied, and Pai perched on his shoulder, explaining he'd used Sasaki's body to exert his power. Though fragile compared to his 40-year-old adult body, it was better than that of a bird. Sasaki asked Pai not to attempt anything dangerous. The sage summoned a portal, taking Sasaki to another world, Batrium, where Pai used to live. Sasaki wondered if he was in one of those Sky stories. The next day, Sasaki went to work. His colleague asked if he arrived too early, as most were delayed due to an incident. They decided to grab some drinks, and Sasaki was asked if he wanted to leave the company with him. Sasaki asked for time to think but admitted he was tempted. The colleague asked if he was too busy with his routine. Sasaki explained that, due to his pet, his life had changed since entering Pai's world. Pai's teleportation helped him get to work and back on time. He also mentioned searching for treasures and trading with high-ranking nobles in Pai's world, transferring the money back to the real world for luxuries. After buying what he needed, Sasaki returned to the other world with Pai, meeting the same girl who lived nearby, offering him food. Sasaki then went to the commercial company Herman, used by the city's controlling nobles. Sasaki sold the items he bought from the human world to the otherworldly company, earning 400 gold coins, which equates to 400 million yen. Since then, he's been conducting business between both worlds, using his free time to learn Pi's spells. However, one day he accidentally triggered an accident, setting off the company's fire suppression system. He told Pai about this, who commented that the outcome wasn't expected, possibly due to Sasaki having a greater affinity for magic than anticipated. After their conversation, Sasaki encountered a chef named French, who had been expelled from his job. It's revealed that French had been a chef since childhood and had been improving his skills. However, his colleagues envied his ability, spreading rumors that he stole food from other restaurants, leading to his dismissal without hearing his side of the story. Seeing an opportunity, Sasaki decided to open a restaurant with French as the head chef. They rented a space in Herman's commercial company, acquiring supplies and ingredients. The restaurant's location on the main street attracted many customers, and French earned more money than he ever dreamed of. He promised Sasaki he'd do his best to ensure the restaurant's success. After staying in the other world for a couple of days to train in Pai's magic, Sasaki returned to the human world to buy items that might appeal to the nobles, particularly those used for hunting, as nobles enjoy hunting as a sport. He then sold them in Pai's world at a much higher price, allowing him to personally meet the nobles, including Viscount Muller. Initially, Sasaki struggled to do business with the Viscount, who was very cautious and scrutinized each item. 
The Viscount interrogated him about the origin of the objects, having heard rumors that they came from another continent. Sasaki fabricated a story, portraying himself as just a craftsman, which convinced Muller. Muller suggested consulting with him if he wanted to sell something, as his crafted items could change the continent's lifestyle. Thus, Sasaki formed a close relationship with the Viscount, improved his restaurant, and continued studying magic. However, one day, he bid farewell to his colleague, who retired from the company and declined his offer to follow him. On his way home, he narrowly avoided being hit by an ice shard and witnessed a man using magic in an alley. He quickly checked the news and learned about a serial killer in Japan. Without hesitation, he intervened, attacking the man from behind with an ice shard, gradually freezing him. The woman prevented the ice shard from killing the man and threatened Sasaki with a weapon demanding to know how he acquired psychic powers. Confused, Sasaki explained he had gained his powers a few days ago. The woman asked him to accompany her, and Sasaki wondered if both she and the killer used magic like him. The woman introduced herself as Hakuzaki and escorted Sasaki for interrogation, explaining about psychics, magicians whose powers manifest spontaneously. One in every 100,000 people possesses psychic powers, and once they appear, they never change. Each psychic has one power, and while there's no record of people having more than one power, it's possible to increase a power's strength or range. Hashizaki used herself as an example, confessing that she controls water and can change its temperature. Upon hearing this, Sasaki assumed these powers were completely different from Pai's world of magic. Hashizaki explained that there are psychic abilities of all kinds, from those capable of destroying a city to those that barely alter one's life. Psychics who use their powers typically have two paths. They either become a threat to society or try to use their powers to contain other threats. When a psychic manifests their abilities, they must register with the government's oversight organization. Sasaki was surprised to hear this, as he had no idea such a thing existed. Hashizaki assured him it was normal, as it was a state secret. They arrived at the organization's building, where Hashizaki informed Sasaki that she would be working there from now on. Sasaki went to an office to be interviewed and interrogated. Hashizaki asked him what abilities he possessed. Sasaki liked the idea of working for the government but also found it dangerous. He discreetly looked at Pai, who advised him to reveal only one power. Sasaki replied that he could only summon ice shards. Hashizaki asked him to demonstrate his ability and Sasaki obliged. Hashizaki smiled, explaining that their abilities were compatible. She couldn't generate water from nothing but could control the ice shard created by Sasaki. Excited about the prospect of working together, Hashizaki, but Sasaki was terrified, seeing her as a workaholic. After the interview, Sasaki went for a walk with Pai. He didn't want to go to the other world near the organization, as he feared detection. He also couldn't speak freely with Pai for fear of hidden cameras or microphones. While walking, Pai warned Sasaki that they were being followed. Sasaki decided to enter a store pretending to shop, then locked himself in the bathroom and traveled to the other world, notifying that the deliveries would be delayed. Sasaki returned to the human world and rested. The next morning, Hashizaki woke him up to accompany her to work early. Sasaki refused, as it was too early and he didn't want to get involved in something so dangerous. Hashizaki's boss, Akistu, appeared to scold her. He gave Sasaki a phone for completing his training, which could also be used to assign emergency missions. Sasaki was called by the building's workers for physical tests. He then discovered that the organization was a building disguised as another type of company for ordinary people. Additionally, all workers were forbidden from discussing the matter with the general public. If discovered on a mission, they could pass themselves off as part of the police without issue. Sasaki received his first paycheck and was surprised to earn a million yen. Returning home, he encountered his neighbor, who gave him some cookies. She then asked if he was dating a girl named Hashizaki. Sasaki, startled by her expression, clarified that she was only his superior. The neighbor remarked that Hashizaki looked too young. Sasaki explained that it was because the company operated on meritocracy and was located abroad. He was cautious not to reveal too much information about the organization's existence, as he had been informed of the consequences for those who leaked information. Sasaki realized that Pai was acting too intense and took him to a park to talk. There, the sage told him that someone had entered their house and installed some kind of device. Sasaki deduced it might be a microphone or camera. He asked if they caught him browsing the internet, but Pai said no, as he saw them as soon as he woke up. Upon returning home, Sasaki uninstalled the device and immediately received a call from his boss 
who praised him for his intelligence. Sasaki asked him not to install anything in his house. Akastu explained it was part of the initiation ritual, which Sasaki had passed successfully. We see Sasaki practicing magic in the other world, and Pai mentions that he didn't expect the protagonist to learn intermediate spells so quickly. Sasaki comments that it's because he has a good teacher. Pai clarifies that he has made an impressive journey for someone initiated in magic, as most mages in this world take more than a decade to learn intermediate spells, achieving them in a few weeks is exceptional. Sasaki tells us that he learned a recovery spell, and an electric one. Sasaki tried to memorize the spells, and Pai mocked him, saying he is a too diligent student. The protagonist comments that he struggles to memorize spells, and Pai advises him to use a grimoire. Sasaki asked where he could get one, and Pai mentions that his own cell phone is his grimoire, explaining that the word grimoire is a generic term for where spells are written, so it doesn't have to be paper and ink. A portable device for noting spells can serve as a grimoire. The protagonist prepared to meet with Mark and asked Pai what he wanted to eat. Pai mentioned that he wants to repeat the meat since it's his favorite food. Later, Sasaki delivered some walkie-talkies to the other world company, and mentioned that those devices need fuel to function. Herman asked if he could make more of these walkie-talkies to buy them, and Sasaki said yes and asked if something had happened. Herman recounted that Viscount Muller asked him to buy all the stocks of very good artifacts, suspecting that a war might occur, so he wants to prepare as best as possible. Sasaki met with French and paid him his monthly salary, also giving him a list of recipes to make at the restaurant. In the human world, the protagonist received a call from Hashizaki, who warned him that they had a personal mission from the boss. The protagonist attended the meeting and lamented being late. Akistu introduced Sasaki to his co-workers, and during the meeting, our protagonist would learn about a mass attack by a group operating in the city and most of its members are irregular psychics. Irregular psychics are people with very dangerous abilities, so the government registers and controls psychics. Sasaki asked if the arrest would be because this group refuses to be registered, and Akistu replies no, explaining that one of those members used his power to harm others. Sasaki saw the list of those involved and was astonished to see that one of them is the same person who attacked Hashizaki. Sasaki decided to go with a full squad to the base of this group, completely terrified of what might happen, and Hashizaki recommended that he not get so nervous since he wouldn't fight. Sasaki wasn't very happy with this, after all, even if he didn't have to fight, just the idea of having to help on the front lines made him an important target for the enemy. A member of the squad told the protagonist that the members of that group have lower ranks than the organization's volunteers, so they could be calm. Sasaki asked Hashizaki if he wasn't afraid of what might happen since a battle between psychics would be equivalent to a shootout. Hashizaki asked him not to think about that but about the money since the higher the risk, the higher the pay. Sasaki asked if, in case someone got injured, the organization would take care of hospitalization. Later, the whole team assigned to the mission showed up at the enemy base, and everyone prepared with heavy armor, shields, and firearms. Sasaki lamented not learning any defense spells. The squad received orders from Akistu on how to act, and everyone entered a dark room. Hashizaki asked them to surrender peacefully, but no one seemed to be there. Suddenly, they heard a fight over the radio and realized they had fallen into a trap because the strategy commanders were being attacked by the enemy group. One of the squad's assistants asked what was happening, and in a moment of carelessness, he died in front of everyone. A tremor shook the facility, and all objects started levitating, slowly rotating to create a whirlwind. The rest of the squad tried to escape as they realized they were trapped with a high-level psychic, but despite their efforts, each one died. Hashizaki decided to step out to defend, and the protagonist supported her by hurling an ice shard. She turned it into water and formed a dense wall to halt all enemy attacks and cushion them. Sasaki sees this moment to try to locate the psychic. A member of the squad was lifted by the enemy psychic's power, and tried to slam him violently to the ground to finish him off. However, Hashizaki managed to save him in time by throwing a water bubble to cushion the impact. Hashizaki realized who they were facing and asked the protagonist to flee. He refused because he didn't want to leave her, but Hashizaki begged him to do so. The protagonist refused, he didn't want to leave her to die nor suffer psychological consequences. He told her he would fight alongside her. Deep down, he knew he couldn't abandon a mission since desertion is a serious crime within the organization. At that moment, Sasaki heard the voice of a girl asking if there were still people alive. She decided to reveal herself, praising Sasaki and Hashizaki for fighting better than she expected. 
This woman wore a long kimono and used her power to lift Hashizaki into the air. She tried to kill her, but Hashizaki reacted quickly, using her water bottle to defend herself. She controlled the water to pick up some glass and broken items, then hurled them as ice shards toward the enemy. The woman was surprised that Hashizaki could control temperature, however, she effortlessly dodged the attack. Hashizaki separated the attack into thin water threads that could harm her, but the girl could easily evade them. This scared Sasaki as he didn't expect someone to be so fast. The girl saw an opportunity and approached close enough to try to kill her. Hashizaki reacted in time, creating a dense ice wall to protect her from the enemy's blow. But it was futile as the enemy concentrated their psychic power in their fists and managed to pierce the wall. Hashizaki found herself in a terrible situation and gave up on herself. The girl mentioned she wouldn't kill her since her ability seemed too useful. She simply touched Hashizaki to render her unconscious and asked Sasaki to leave or Hashizaki would die. The protagonist sighed, the plan had failed. He analyzed the situation. The entire team was out of commission and he wasn't sure about attacking since the rest of the enemy group might be lurking. Sasaki thought about engaging in close combat with the woman but didn't see it as viable since he couldn't keep up with her pace even if he wished to. He had no choice but to try to negotiate. Sasaki decided to reveal himself to the woman and asked if they could set aside violence. The girl was surprised to see him. It was the first time she had seen him, and she made mention of it. Sasaki introduced himself to her with an unsettling expression. He took advantage of this expression to better survey the area. Although it was dark, he realized there was something he could use as a weapon. The girl asked Sasaki if he was Hashizaki's water source, which the protagonist affirmed to buy more time. Seeing that things were progressing too quickly, he changed the subject and praised the girl for her psychic power, as she could levitate things and control the terrain, making it easy to eliminate any enemy. The protagonist asked her what the name of the group she belonged to was. The woman was surprised by this question. It was the first time someone didn't know them. Sasaki realized it was some famous criminal group, which excited the girl, bringing out her more sinister side. She asked if he was new. Sasaki confirmed this, realizing that revealing his lack of experience was a mistake. But he had no choice but to continue. He mentioned he had hoped to encounter the group and introduce himself or get to know them better without resorting to violence. So he asked them all to come out of hiding. Although he couldn't detect them, he wanted to know how many there were. The woman realized what he was trying to do and mocked him, mentioning that he seemed too calm for someone new to the situation. The protagonist commented that right now, his only resource is his ignorance. The girl praised him for his optimism, and Sasaki asked again for everyone to come out of hiding and introduce themselves. The girl remarked that the group wasn't going to come out even if he asked. Sasaki mentioned that then it's a pity not being able to meet them all. It was at this moment that the protagonist decided to act and internally prayed not to harm Hashizaki. The girl analyzed him and asked if he was reciting a spell. The protagonist unleashed a powerful electric discharge that caught the woman off guard. She narrowly dodged the attack, wondering what that was. The electric discharge caused significant damage, and the woman didn't hesitate to levitate everything. Sasaki was alarmed to see this, all objects flew towards him to hurt him. However, he used electricity to cut and redirect each projectile coming his way. When he saw the opportunity, he would unleash a lightning bolt towards the woman, causing an explosion. This explosion affected two psychics hiding in the area, and the protagonist was glad that it worked. He continued analyzing everything and believed they might be all there. The woman managed to survive that explosion, and her wound regenerated. She asked the protagonist what kind of psychic he exactly is. Confidently, Sasaki reminded the woman that, as he mentioned before, he is someone new to the job. This confidence made the woman see our protagonist as a threat to be respected. Sasaki clarified that he would like to make a proposal to the group. He mentioned that if they promised not to disclose anything they just saw, and what happened, he wouldn't harm anyone in the group, so they could consider the confrontation a draw. He revealed that despite being a psychic, he didn't want to harm himself by using his own power. The woman fell silent and accepted the proposal. As the protagonist was about to leave, the woman stopped him, asking for his name again. Sasaki introduced himself again, and the girl gave him the opportunity to join their criminal group. Sasaki refused this, explaining that he feels more comfortable in a group and without standing out. The woman mentioned that if he ever became interested in joining the criminal group, he could try to find her, and she would be happy to recruit him. Sasaki took this opportunity to ask the girl about the commanders who were in charge of the strategy. She told him they were fine, just taken as hostages, and she was willing to release them because the fight was suspended. Sasaki thanked her for that decision, 
and the girl left, disappearing into the darkness. After seeing he was alone, he was relieved he managed to save himself. Later, the police, ambulance, and psychic organization arrived in the area to attend to the wounded. Sasaki was interrogated by Akistu to find out what had happened. Sasaki explained that the enemy withdrew on their own. Akistu didn't take this seriously, and the protagonist realized, so he asked if he didn't believe him. Akistu clarified that he didn't but decided to trust him. He apologized as his boss for sending him on such a dangerous mission for it to be only the first and being barely a novice in the psychic world. Sasaki asked him not to worry about it. Akistu gave him the rest of the day off and advised him to go home to rest. The protagonist took the opportunity to leave there. He went to the ambulance vehicle where Hashizaki was and asked if she was okay. She affirmed, and the protagonist was relieved, fearing he had caused her an injury after that explosion. Hoshizaki asked Sasaki if he had free time after all that happened. The protagonist commented that yes, deep down, he didn't want to tell her that he just wanted to go home to rest, otherwise, she would be upset. Hoshizaki thanked him for saving her and for not abandoning her. In the evening, they both went to dinner at an expensive restaurant. She thanked him again, but Sasaki commented that, in the end, it was the job they had to do. However, he wasn't entirely happy because she got injured due to his fear. The protagonist apologized for being a coward, but Hashizaki clarified that being afraid is normal and despite that, he saved her life again. They spent the night eating and drinking. Sasaki asked Hashizaki out of curiosity about her age, and she revealed she's 17, explaining that she dresses older so that people don't underestimate her. After this, Sasaki would encounter a girl who escaped through a strange portal, and he wondered what kind of ability that could be. We see Pai and Sasaki eating Kobe beefsteak, which excited Pai as he always wanted to try that kind of meat. Sasaki tells him that all this is to thank him for what he has done for him. Pai decided to taste the meat and was surprised by the flavor. Our protagonist stayed watching Pai, seeing how adorable he is. After the meal, he cleaned him up. Pai comments that he can tell he's had a bad day. Sasaki responds that he wished he had learned some defense spells. Pai proposed to teach him some kind of healing magic. Sasaki accepted this proposal and commented that it would be after he finished negotiating with Mark. His idea was to finish negotiating, train, and then sleep. However, upon arriving in the other world, he was surprised to learn that a war will occur. The governor apologized, saying it's not the best time to tell him that news. He reveals that the king requested him to go to the front. As the Ojin Empire is extensive and powerful, they have almost twice the forces as hers. If the enemy were to reach the village, it would cause great damage. For that reason, he wants Sasaki's help. The latter comments that he is just a craftsman, so he doesn't see a way to be useful. The governor confesses that he already knows who he is, but the objects he has brought to his domains could be of great help in the war, so he wants him to become the exclusive resource provider for the duration of the war. Sasaki comments that he can support with food and some supplies. The governor explains that a carriage will take two weeks to reach the front, Gathering everything and transporting it in less than a month seems impossible. Although he is negotiating with Herman's boss, given the rise in food prices, forcing him to collaborate would destroy the economy faster than any enemy. Sasaki mentions that he apologizes in advance for his reckless proposal, but he believes that the smartest thing would be to leave the kingdom. Muller asked him if he has heard of the Stellar Sage. The protagonist responds that he hasn't, but Pai was surprised to hear this name. The Viscount recounts that, about a century ago, the kingdom of hers was a prosperous land full of magical technology, but due to the exploitation perpetrated by a certain group of nobles, most of the mages left the kingdom. In their absence, who managed to maintain peace was a very talented mage known as the Stellar Sage, who worked tirelessly in the service of the kingdom. But that ended a few years ago, as a faction of nobles, dissatisfied with his majesty, had the great mage killed. Since then, hers entered a cycle of corruption and decay, they reached a point where they are close to self-destruction. Muller clarifies that the nobles deserve this fate for committing many imprudences over time, so he cannot follow his advice, as he wishes to die in the service of his homeland and will protect the people as a true lord would. Sasaki apologized for giving that suggestion and commented that he will do his best to attend to his request. Muller thanked him for his generosity. The protagonist clarifies that he will help him, but he must promise him one thing. After this meeting, Sasaki left the Viscount's castle exhausted and one of the guards patted him on the back. The protagonist was leaving and a carriage passed by his side. One of the guards recognized the carriage and commented that it is Count Dietrich's. Sasaki looked curiously at the carriage and then retired to the village. Pai asked our protagonist why he asked for that, 
as he shouldn't worry about him, Sasaki asked him not to worry about that favor and asked him how he thinks the war will end. Pai responds that he doubts the kingdom will lose the war. He asks the protagonist what he wanted to do and Sasaki comments that if he could, he would like to help, but even if he wanted to, for now, he can't do much. Pai clarifies that, although they can't do anything about it for the moment, they can change the course of the war with their knowledge and magic. Then he introduced himself as a great stellar sage from another world and confesses that his power could quell any conflict between kingdoms. Destruction is of little consequence, on the other hand, creating something requires much more effort. For that reason, you shouldn't give up so easily on the connections you've made in the city. Sasaki was somewhat motivated by Pai's words and commented that he would think of a way to resolve the war without attracting attention. Later, Sasaki went to the restaurant and found French somewhat disheartened. He asked if something had happened. French told the protagonist that his former boss asked him to sell everything he had at a reduced price. He felt indebted to him because he was the person who taught him everything about cooking. However, he was confused because he also felt indebted to the protagonist because he was the one who took him off the streets and gave him a job, so he didn't want to betray his trust. Sasaki thanked him for daring to speak his mind and asked him that the next time something like that happened, he should tell him so that he would have time to think of a solution. French refused this, saying that he didn't want to cause him more trouble. Sasaki responded that he wants to protect the restaurant but also its employees. Later, our protagonist visited the Kepler Lund shopping center, known for its commercial cities. This company is one of the largest in the city of Nuzonia. Sasaki went to the company and entered the office with a request sheet. One of the employees commented that there were too many things. Sasaki mentioned that he had the impression that in the shopping center, he would find plenty of items. The employee deduced that with that kind of purchases, it means that a war had broken out. He said he could tell because one of the southern branches said that the price of food was rising too much and that relations with the neighbors had become tense. Sasaki confirmed this and said that he was buying supplies for a country at war. The employee agreed to help but asked if it wouldn't be complicated to transport all the resources since if the war changes, he will end up receiving losses like a merchant. However, those kinds of decisions reminded him of a former businessman he used to work with, who was too confident in his decisions and that got him into some troubles that could have ended very badly. Sasaki reassured him that such an event would not happen again. The employee commented that he could see that he is not a native of the continent. Sasaki explained that, because of that situation, it is easier for someone like him to move, and he believes he can guarantee the good faith of the merchants as it doesn't require influence, money, or power, but talent to profit from something. The employee asked if he would visit other businesses. Sasaki replied that he wouldn't because he only wants to do business with Kepler. The employee asked how he plans to pay, and the protagonist replied that he will do it as indicated on the order sheet, paying with gold coins from hers. The man decided to accept his conditions, and the protagonist was pleased. Several days later, Sasaki took Muller to a warehouse. The Viscount was surprised that our protagonist could fill the warehouse in a couple of days. The protagonist asked if all that would be enough. Muller replied that yes, and said he didn't know how to thank him for all his work. With those supplies, they could gain a lot of time, and even some lives would be saved during the war. The Viscount asked the protagonist if it's possible that, like the Stellar Sage, he could use magic to transport himself to other places. Sasaki thought about the situation, aware that he couldn't reveal Pai's identity as it would put him in the spotlight. So he thought of bringing attention to himself. Sasaki asked the Viscount if he could keep the secret. Muller replied that yes, and Sasaki decided to ask why the wizard was nicknamed the Stellar Sage. Muller explained that the number of spells that Sage knew was more than the number of stars in the sky. As he knew so much, someone started calling him that, and that's where the nickname comes from. He clarified that he hadn't met any other mage with a repertoire like the sage's. Although according to the stories, the wizard seemed ashamed when called the Stellar Sage. That night, Muller and the protagonist bid farewell, both wishing each other luck. Muller commented that he would have liked to have the same courage as him because if so, he would have avoided the death of the Stellar Sage. He clarified that he was in debt to the protagonist and left. However, Sasaki appeared in the village a month later and learned that Viscount Muller had died in a battle. This news affected him, as he considered the Viscount a friend, causing him to be very distracted in his missions in the human world. Akistu noticed that Sasaki was very distracted and asked if something was wrong. The protagonist immediately denied it. Akistu apologized for calling the protagonist so suddenly but did so because he wanted to give him a promotion. He said that the incident the other day left many injured, so they have many vacancies to fill as soon as possible. 
Akistu handed him his badge, which the protagonist took and was surprised to see that he had now become an inspector in the special crimes unit. Akistu confessed that he knows a promotion after what happened might not be too pleasing, but he hoped that someday he would understand. Sasaki commented that he would, and Akistu decided to give him his first mission as an inspector. He explained that he would like him to work with Hashizaki to recruit psychics. The protagonist mentioned that he has no problem recruiting psychics but doesn't feel comfortable working with Hashizaki. Akistu explained that there are many ways to recruit psychics. The most extreme ones involve blackmailing the wildest ones with information the police have, and other times they negotiate with those who have worked illegally. These words reminded Sasaki of the incident and he decided to accept working with Hoshizaki. At night, Sasaki returned home and met his neighbor, who wished him good night. Sasaki decided to give her some food and told her that he bought it to get numbers for a raffle, but he can't eat it all alone, so she can help him with that. The protagonist would bring cake to Pai but noticed that he was completely discouraged. He asked if he was a friend of Muller's, and Pai replied yes, they drank together on some occasions and he helped him cope with some things. Deep down, he believed Muller would live longer. Sasaki asked if there is any kind of magic in the other world that can resurrect the dead. Pai replied no and asked if such spells exist in the human world. Sasaki denied it. Pai commented that he must surely feel the same for all the people who died in the incident, and couldn't do anything. However, he sees it worse being someone very long-lived and seeing everyone he loves die. Sasaki thought of a way to disconnect Pai from his problems. He told him that if he needs help with anything, he can always ask because, after all, they are friends and he is also his pet. Pai praised him for being a good speaker, and the protagonist commented that he always strives to be one. After this, Sasaki returned to the other world and visited the restaurant. He asked French how the problem has been handled. He replied that his former boss and his men haven't returned. However, it seems that the death of the Viscount has caused many people to leave the city. At that moment, Mark entered the restaurant to desperately tell the protagonist that Muller's butler wants to speak with him. Sasaki went to the castle and met Elsa, the Viscount's daughter. Here he would learn that a succession crisis was occurring after Muller's death. Elsa's brothers, Maximilian and Kai, are competing with each other to be the next head of the family. Elsa explained that Kai is too foolish and if he were to become the head, the whole country would be finished. The butler asked Elsa not to act that way in public. The butler apologized for Elsa's attitude and said that she is very close to Maximilian and less close to Kai. Sasaki asked what they needed, and the butler said he was worried about Elsa's safety, so he wants to leave her in Herman's care until the succession crisis is resolved. Both decided to accept the responsibility of protecting her. After all, they felt indebted to Muller because, thanks to him, they were able to expand their business. Sasaki was somewhat confused by the situation and asked why they called him. The butler said that the Viscount spoke to him about some tools that the protagonist brought from distant lands and that they could see and communicate with distant objects. Sasaki commented that he still has that merchandise, and the butler asked for those tools. The protagonist began to suspect this, but he had no choice but to accept help. We see a man chatting with another on the phone, telling him that many of the nobles supporting the brothers are very greedy. Now that Mr. Muller isn't around to keep the nobles in check, anything could trigger a much bigger conflict. If everything went according to plan, he could retire as he pleased, revealing that the butler planned to stir up internal family conflict. We switch scenes to Sasaki with Elsa, both eating curry, and the princess comments that the dish was exquisite. This cheered up the protagonists. We're told that Elsa has been living hidden in Herman for some time now, and apparently, she has already gotten used to that lifestyle. Elsa looked at Pai and asked if she could pet him. Sasaki didn't know how to respond, but he was surprised to see Pai approaching Elsa to be petted, pretending to be an ordinary bird. By accident, Elsa hurt Pai's eye, and he complained of pain. The princess, frightened, asked if Pai could speak. Sasaki pretended as if nothing had happened. Pai continued to act like a normal bird, though he was somewhat nervous. Elsa was completely convinced that Pai had spoken. Mark entered the restaurant and interrupted the conversation asking the princess to return to the mansion immediately. Sasaki accompanied her to Muller Castle. The butler mentions that he found several objects in the forest behind the castle. Upon revealing the objects, they were surprised to see two worn-out swords, which belonged to Elsa's brothers. Sasaki asked if they found the brothers, but the butler replied that, although they explored the entire area, they are missing. All they could find were the swords and some areas where there were signs of combat. The butler asked Elsa to assume the position of head of the Muller family. Sasaki didn't hesitate to intervene, saying that it's not the best time for that. Mark asked him to remain silent. 
the butler explains that with such misfortunes like this, she is the only one who can claim the title. If she refused, the family would disappear. However, they can do one thing. She could have the title while he takes care of everything until she can marry. Elsa initially had doubts, but after thinking about it for a while, she decided to accept the proposal. The butler thanked her and promised to help her in any way he could from now on. Then we see all the villagers evacuating the village. Sasaki asked Mark why the villagers are evacuating at this point. Mark explains that not all villagers were aware that the king's forces at the front were decimated by the enemy. This forced many people to start looking for safer places to live. It is also said that the Ojin Empire is attacking the neighbors. Mark says that the villagers are taking entire carriages with all their belongings. This situation complicates all businesses, and Mark confesses that he plans to go to the capital with Elsa soon. He gathered the courage and asked Sasaki if he would like to go with them to the capital. The protagonist thanked him for the invitation but asked him not to worry about him. Mark, surprised, asked if his words are sincere, as the whole situation lately has been sad. He explains that Elsa's probably first task as head of the family will be to abandon the lands her lineage has cared for generations. Sasaki went with Pai to a lake to observe the scenery. Pai asked a favor of the protagonist, and the latter asked if he's planning to change the course of the war. Pai remained silent, and Sasaki agreed to the favor, asking if they will use teleportation as usual. Pai tells him that no, although they know magic, they don't know where the enemy is at the moment. When night falls, they'll depart differently. Sasaki asked how they would travel. Later that night, a shooting star was visible. That shooting star was Sasaki, who was flying at full speed thanks to a spell from Pai. Our protagonist praised him, saying that the spell was impressive, as he had always wanted to fly. Pai asked if that quality in the human world is called an airplane, and the protagonist replied yes, but it's nothing like this, explaining that humanity has always dreamed of flying without relying on technology. He asked if it was possible for Pai to teach him the spell, and Pai replied yes, but he would do it another time. After a while of flying, they could see from above the bases of the Ojin Empire forces. Sasaki asked what they should do, and Pai recommended that they finish everything with one spell. It wasn't necessary to make the enemy suffer. Pai decided to show Sasaki another spell, saying that someday, he might have to learn it. Pai invoked a magical seal and through them unleashed a powerful green ray, which disintegrated the entire base. Sasaki was surprised by the power of the spell. Pai explained that the spell has a dispersed area of effect, but it can also be focused on a point. It's a quite flexible type of attack. Sasaki clenched his hand tightly. He couldn't comprehend what he had seen. Pai tried to calm him down, saying that it wasn't him who killed them, and advised him not to torment himself. Sasaki thanked him for those words and tried to return home, but a spell came out of nowhere to attack them. Pai didn't hesitate to create a barrier, stopping the attack. That barrier broke, and a mysterious woman appeared behind Pai, trying to kill him. Pai quickly began dodging the blows and moved away. Sasaki began to fall uncontrollably through the air, and used an ice spell to create a waterfall from which he could descend without harm. Out of curiosity, he looked up at the sky and was surprised to see Pai's fight. The latter threw several fire projectiles that caused a giant explosion. The woman dodged it in an instant and tried to hit Pai. He did the same, returning the blow. The impact of both attacks caused a chain of explosions. The woman used a spell to create an energy dragon and have it devour Pai. He created an ice shuriken with which he was able to destroy the dragon. He maintained a fast pace to not be at a disadvantage against the woman. Sasaki heard someone approaching and saw two knights coming out of the forest. Upon seeing one of them, he recognized him, it was Viscount Muller. He was surprised that he was alive and quickly tended to his wounds using a healing spell. Sasaki introduced himself to the other knight, and Muller explained to the young man that the protagonist is a foreign merchant with business in his domains. The knight asked what a merchant would be doing in the enemy base. Muller reassured him, saying that Sasaki is not the enemy. The boy thanked him, after all, he had just saved his life. Muller decided to introduce the boy, who was named Adnus, the second prince of the kingdom of hers. Upon hearing that he was a prince, Sasaki quickly bowed as a sign of respect. Muller confessed that he was surprised that someone like him knew how to use healing magic. Sasaki commented that he was the one surprised since he had heard that Muller supposedly died in combat. Muller said that there was indeed a fight, but the reality is that he and Adnus got separated from the allies, so it's normal for such news to have surfaced. Muller told Sasaki that he's trying to reach a nearby settlement and asked if he could accompany them. Sasaki agreed, but an arrow fell close to them as a warning. A rain of arrows came against Sasaki, and he created a barrier to protect himself. 
He analyzed the direction from which the arrows were coming and threw a powerful lightning bolt towards the area, taking out several archers. The enemy army emerged from the forest, removing a magical object that made them invisible. Muller quickly supported Sasaki and effortlessly defeated the entire enemy army. Sasaki carried Adonis, and Muller commented that he was surprised that he knew so many spells. The protagonist explained that he had a good teacher. Muller, upon hearing this, commented that he hopes to meet his teacher someday. Meanwhile, we see a village being attacked by monsters. Sasaki appeared to take out each one of them and save the civilians, while Adonis and Muller supported in the fight. Sasaki handled the ranged attacks, while Adonis and Muller dealt with the close combat. The three of them seemed somewhat overwhelmed by the number of orcs in the area, and Muller deduced that there might be an elite monster commanding them. Muller advised him not to separate from Sasaki. The elite monster appeared and went to attack the group. Our protagonist pushed the orc back with his lightning, but it wasn't enough to defeat it. Muller took advantage of the monster's retreat to attack it with a slash, but the orc's armor protected it and it delivered a strong kick to Muller. Sasaki protected Muller with a magical barrier. The orc became more aggressive and tried to kill them, but a meteorite fell from the sky, crushing them brutally. It was Pai, who returned from his fight and perched on Sasaki's shoulders. He apologized for being late. Suddenly, the elite orc broke the meteorite and became more aggressive. Pai deduced that it was an elite orc and would use a special spell, creating a rock golem that Muller recognized. That golem was enough to defeat the orc, and after this, the golem disappeared. Pai explained that elite beings can be found in plants, animals, and even humans. People like him or Sasaki could be considered elite class of humanity. Muller was surprised that Pai could talk. The bird apologized to the protagonist for releasing him earlier. Sasaki commented that nothing had happened. He had been able to land safely with his magic. Soon it was dawn, and Muller asked Sasaki if that bird could actually talk. Sasaki decided to introduce Pai, telling them that he is his magic teacher. Muller asked Pai if by any chance he was the Stellar Sage. Pai asked him what made him think that. Muller explained that it's because of his spells and his way of speaking, something like that could never be forgotten. After all, he's the man he always admired. Pai had no choice but to admit his identity and told Muller that it had been a long time since they had seen each other, calling him by Julius. Muller was surprised to hear that name and knelt down. Pai was glad to see Adonis safe, and the latter bowed. Pai explained that after dying, he passed to another world in the form of a bird and apologized for not telling them anything. Pai clarified that the Stellar Sage is dead and now wishes to be Sasaki's pet and live peacefully in peace. The protagonist explained that thanks to Pai, he was able to get supplies to help the soldiers in the war. In addition to that, it was him who eliminated the forces of Ojin. Sasaki asked both of them to keep the matter of the Stellar Sage and everything they know about them a secret. Both Adonis and Muller agreed to keep the secret. The four teleported to the castle, and the soldiers were surprised to see Adonis and Muller alive. Upon seeing Muller, Elsa couldn't help but cry and went to hug him. Mark asked the protagonist what all this meant. Sasaki explained that he found Adonis and Muller by chance. He clarified that it's a long story, but the important thing is that they return safely and Ojin no longer poses any threat, so they can rest from now on. Mark asked how that's possible. Sasaki explained that the two of them annihilated Ojin's army overnight. Maximilian and Kai appeared to greet Muller. The three explained to Elsa that it had all been a strategy to deceive the enemy, and make them attack confidently. Muller apologized to Sasaki for deceiving him with his plan. He explained that with the outbreak of war and the increase in disputes among the noble factions, people around him began to behave strangely. For that reason, he faked his death in combat to identify the traitors. Muller learned from Sasaki that the butler was the one acting strange, so he didn't hesitate to imprison the butler. Sasaki was surprised that Muller had stayed alive for so long, all thanks to being a great strategist. Elsa thanked the protagonist for saving Muller and returned to her family. We see Sasaki's neighbor, who wondered where the protagonist was, as she hadn't seen him for several days and didn't know if he had changed his routine or shift at work. She knew nothing about him and was worried. She had known Sasaki for years and had never seen him outside his house for more than three days. She finished her snack and put the trays away in the school kitchen. After classes, she returned home calmly and prayed for Sasaki to return soon. On her way back home, she found a woman stabbed in an alley and was horrified by the scene. She immediately called the police to investigate what had happened. The girl, for her part, stayed in the police car, answering all the questions the officers asked her. They thanked her for her cooperation. Two men in black appeared, realizing that the scene had to do with psychics. One of the men suggested calling Hashizaki and the protagonist. 
The girl overheard this conversation, discovering that Sasaki was also a psychic. The next day, we see the protagonist receiving a message that he had to work on the case that occurred. Sasaki felt guilty for what happened because he had been away for so long and neglected his duties in the real world. Hai read the news with Sasaki, and they both discovered that the flow of time between both worlds was advancing differently. They were puzzled by the situation since time was moving twice as fast as before. Sasaki was somewhat worried about this, but Pai explained that there are phenomena called temporal disturbances, which are normal in their world. However, Pai asked Sasaki to investigate further since it was not normal for a disturbance to occur in the real world. They both reviewed the organization's reports and went over the things they did in the other world. After resolving the conflict over the family succession, Prince Adnus and the country's king recognized Sasaki as the royal knight in the family's service. Our protagonist tells Pai that he doesn't see anything that could have affected the flow of time. Pai agreed, but their conversation was interrupted by the doorbell, and Sasaki went out, meeting Hoshizaki. They both went to fulfill a task. Hoshizaki explained to Sasaki that the mission was to recruit a psychic who is a student in Saitama Prefecture. The protagonist was surprised to hear that a student was going to be recruited. Hoshizaki explained that this student has manifested psychic phenomena around him. According to the research file, this student masters pyrokinesis and is capable of producing small flamethrowers. For now, he has not shown signs of hostility, and everything that has happened has been at his home without any witnesses. Sasaki asked if she was sent because of her ability to counteract pyrokinesis, and Hoshizaki affirmed this and proposed to recruit the student. The protagonist commented that they were taking the matter lightly and asked if they shouldn't investigate psychics more carefully. Hoshizaki asked her to be more specific about what she was saying since the student only has the power of an E-rank. Sasaki commented that, according to what happened several days ago, she is still not used to fighting. Hoshizaki clarified that he had permission from the chief to use firearms if the student decided to use his power for evil, which surprised Sasaki upon hearing this. Both arrived at the school and introduced themselves as inspectors to the principal. They searched the entire facility for the boy until they finally found him walking in the courtyard. Sasaki analyzed the student and commented that he seemed like an ordinary person. Both decided to follow him to a secluded area of the school, where they would discover that the boy had met up with his bullies. They were asking the young man to bring more money. Hoshizaki wanted to intervene, but Sasaki stopped her, asking her to observe a little longer. Hoshizaki warned him that they needed to act quickly because if he used his ability against the bullies, it would be worse. The protagonist mentioned that the boy didn't have those intentions, as he could see that the abuse and harassment had been going on for some time. If he hasn't used his power yet, it means he has been enduring everything for quite some time. He advised establishing contact with the boy when he was alone. Hoshizaki accepted this, on the condition that she would be the one to negotiate with him thus giving her the opportunity to complete the report and finish the job quickly. Sasaki decided to go to a cafe to write the report. He drank a luxurious tea and finished the report faster than he expected. He noticed that the boy was accompanied by his girlfriend on the streets and decided to spy on them. He wondered where Hashizaki was, as she should have followed the boy. At that moment, the bullies appeared to interrupt the young man's date and invited the girl to go to karaoke. The boy didn't hesitate to defend her, however, the bullies tried to forcefully take the girl away. The upset boy used pyrokinesis, throwing a large fireball into the sky, which collided with a plane. Everyone was scared to see this. Sasaki immediately intervened by creating a barrier to protect them all from the falling plane. The explosion caused the barrier to crack but everyone managed to escape alive. Sasaki approached the girl to ask if she was okay, only to realize it was Hashizaki. She scolded him, asking what he was doing out on the street. The protagonist returned the same question to her. Annoyed, Hashizaki asked if they were being followed, which the protagonist denied, explaining that he saw everything by chance. Additionally, he clarified that he couldn't recognize her from a distance. Hashizaki looked at the barrier and asked Sasaki if the barrier was part of his power. Our protagonist, to cover up, said he wasn't sure. Hashizaki decided to ignore this and asked Sasaki to use his ice power to hide the incident. They both combined their powers and put the bullies to sleep. Hashizaki mentioned to the protagonist that if another psychic had raised the barrier, they should have shown up a while ago. She asked Sasaki if he has more psychic powers than a magical girl. The protagonist didn't know what she meant by that. 
Hashizaki explained that there are seven psychics considered as magical girls. They are psychics who can cause unusual phenomena in very different ways from other psychics. One of the seven girls is Japanese and is killing psychics on the streets. She is a kind of serial killer. Sasaki was surprised to hear this, as he had many doubts, but Hashizaki asked them to leave the topic for another day. They both had to take care of making the barrier disappear because if someone recorded it and uploaded it to the internet, they would have many problems with the organization and the government. At that moment, a powerful psychic attack came out of nowhere, hitting the barrier. This attack would open a portal to another dimension, from which emerged a magical girl who observed them. Sasaki recognized her as he had seen her one night in an alley. Hashizaki was alarmed by this and asked the protagonist to flee as soon as possible. The magical girl asked Sasaki if he was the same person she had seen before. Hashizaki was surprised and asked the protagonist if he knew her. Sasaki told her that he only knew her from one night when he found her begging for food near his apartment, and they spoke a couple of times. Hashizaki began to suspect the origin of the barrier. The magical girl asked the protagonist if he was a psychic. Sasaki immediately denied this and asked her what she was doing in the city again. She mentioned that she saw a fireball in the sky which caught her attention. Sasaki tried to tell the magical girl that it was all her imagination, but she denied this as she knew that something blocked her beam. She deduced that there must be at least two psychics in the area. Sasaki remained calm about the matter and asked her what her relationship was with the psychics. She told him that she is dedicated to killing them and couldn't allow them to escape. Sasaki asked her if by any chance she lived near the same street. The magical girl revealed that she has a supermarket nearby where a lot of food is thrown away, so she often visits the area for this food. Then she asked Sasaki again if he was a psychic. The protagonist denied this, and the magical girl asked him why he was there, accompanying Hashizaki. Sasaki explained that the police must investigate places where there is disturbance, and he is one of them. The magical girl began to suspect this, but our protagonist managed to deceive her by showing his badge. He had some hope that at least with this, they could take the unconscious students far away. However, he also wanted to be alone with the magical girl, as they could resolve the matter better that way. At that moment, Shizuka Futari appeared, one of the criminals Sasaki faced on his first mission as a psychic. Our protagonist and Hashizaki recognized Shizuka. The latter did not expect a magical girl to appear. Shizuka asked Sasaki if he was in trouble against the magical girl. She clarified that if so, she was willing to help them. The magical girl asked Shizuka if she is a psychic. With a mocking smile, Shizuka asked what would happen if she were. The magical girl commented that she would kill her. She sensed some energy in Shizuka and did not hesitate to use her magic wand to unleash a powerful psychic attack, which caused an explosion. The girl was surprised to see that Shizuka disappeared. Shizuka had managed to dodge the attack and intended to counterattack from the air, but she was injured by Sasaki's barrier. Hashizaki took advantage of the distraction to throw several projectiles at Shizuka, managing to hit her. One of the projectiles pierced her abdomen. Hashizaki ran towards Shizuka and attacked her uncontrollably. Shizuka demonstrated her great speed, dodging each of the attacks, and scolded Hashizaki, saying that she is there to help him. Hashizaki begged the protagonist to flee immediately before things got worse. Shizuka placed a finger on Hashizaki's forehead and knocked her out. Sasaki was alarmed, but Shizuka reassured him, explaining that she only rendered her unconscious. After all, they both have unfinished business, and she didn't want to settle it by playing dirty. She decided to ask Sasaki a favor, but the magical girl interrupted the conversation, asking Sasaki if he knew the psychic. Sasaki pondered the situation and had no choice but to ally with Shizuka. He explained that he would be the bait, and while that happened, he could attack the magical girl. However, he asked Shizuka not to kill her. Shizuka was astonished to hear this condition and asked if he knew the magical girl, which our protagonist affirmed. Shizuka had no choice but to accept the condition. Quickly, Sasaki went to attack the magical girl. The latter threw a powerful psychic ray. Our protagonist created a shield, managing to block the attack. This surprised the magical girl, who did not expect there to be such a strong psychic. Sasaki told the girl that what he had just done was not psychic power, but magic, and like her, he is a magical boy. The girl remained serious upon hearing this and asked if some kind of fairy had asked for his help. Sasaki didn't know how to respond, and Shizuka seized the opportunity to attack the magical girl from behind. But this went wrong as she was electrocuted. Sasaki asked where the fairy who asked for her help was. She said that fairy is no longer in the world. Sasaki questioned her to see if she had returned from the fairyland. But the magical girl revealed that the fairy actually died. 
Not only that, but she herself was the one who ended the fairy's life. To demonstrate this, she showed the fairy's skin, which she used as a coat. Sasaki asked what she meant by murdering her. She explained that she never asked to be a magical girl, so she killed her for that reason. The protagonist took the opportunity to ask her how she could cast spells without reciting incantations. She didn't know what he meant, and Sasaki told her that in his case, to use magic, he had to recite some incantations. With this, the girl assumed that Sasaki was indeed a magical boy. However, she wanted to know why he was collaborating with the psychics. Sasaki clarified that he only knows Shizuka by chance. The girl asked if she could kill her, but the protagonist denied this and questioned her to find out why she had so much hatred towards the psychics. She explained that the psychics wiped out her family, and she is seeking revenge. The four noticed that a child was watching the whole conflict. The magical girl decided to retreat through the port. We see Sasaki and Shizuka in an apartment, where they would leave the unconscious students in the beds. Our protagonist thanked her for helping him, and she commented that he didn't need to thank her since she knew he would have done the same for her. Sasaki asked Shizuka about what she wanted to ask him, and she revealed that she would like to work for his company and wanted to know if he was willing to hire her. Sasaki apologized, explaining that he didn't have the authority to hire someone. Shizuka asked if she could contact his superior to discuss the matter. The protagonist wanted to know why she needed it so urgently, and Shizuka responded that she was interested in him, so she wanted to follow him without getting into trouble with the government for his crimes. Sasaki took this as a joke, mentioning that he's just an ordinary middle-aged man. Shizuka reminded him that she saw him create icebergs and electric discharges. Considering how psychic powers work, she couldn't understand what kind of power could unleash such a combination. Besides that, he was able to block the attack of a magical girl. She would directly ask him if he was hiding his true abilities from his own organization. Sasaki got nervous hearing this, as Shizuka hit the mark, he pretended, mentioning it's an interesting theory. Shizuka clarified that if she talks to his superior, she won't say anything about what happened with the magical girl. Sasaki received a call from Akatsu, the latter asked the protagonist what he was doing. Sasaki would tell him about the fight he had with the magical girl. Akatsu asked if the cargo plane from the air base that crashed was caused by the fight. The protagonist replied yes, explaining that the cargo plane was hit by one of the magical girl's attacks. Akatsu decided to believe him, and Sasaki told him that he received a request from an irregular psychic. Akatsu asked who it was, the protagonist told him about Shizuka and explained everything that happened. When the call ended, the protagonist revealed to Shizuka that she would be interviewed by his boss. Shizuka thanked him. Sasaki asked if he could ask for an additional favor. She paid attention. And Sasaki commented that, in case she gets hired, Akatsu will put surveillance cameras in her residence. He recommended her to find and dismantle it to pass a test. He clarified that telling her this probably goes against the rules, but he had to do it to prevent her from being treated as a spy. Hashizaki woke up and heard this conversation. She asked the protagonist if that was true. Sasaki asked what she meant and remained alert. Hashizaki asked if it's true that Akatsu installs cameras and microphones in the agent's houses. The protagonist explains that according to what Akatsu told him, it's his way of testing the agent's loyalty. Sasaki remembered that he needed to buy a few things for Pai and went to look for them. Shizuka decided to accompany him. She was surprised to see that he liked jam and praised him for having refined tastes. The protagonist tells her that he actually buys it because it tenderizes the meat. Later, Hashizaki and Sasaki went to the organization's building. Hashizaki asked if he knows Shizuka for a long time. Our protagonist mentions that no, as they were talking about jams and plums. Since he didn't know much about plums, Shizuka gave him some authentic pickled plums, which she prepares homemade. Hashizaki annoyed reminds Sasaki that she is a dangerous person despite her personality, revealing that Shizuka is a rank of psychic. He explained that her psychic power consists of draining energy and extracting life force from whatever she touches, which enables her to gain an unimaginable amount of energy to be able to regenerate herself. Sasaki would understand how Shizuka left Hashizaki unconscious. The latter also revealed that according to some records, it is likely that Shizuka is centuries old due to the nature of her psychic power. Sasaki and Hashizaki went to Akatsu's office, where he told them that the fire psychic had been transferred to another department. Hashizaki took the opportunity to ask him if it's true that he puts cameras and microphones in agents' houses. Akatsu asked what would happen if he did so. Hashizaki commented that it was wrong, but Akatsu clarified that he doesn't leak anything from the recordings. Hashizaki insisted that it was wrong, saying that it could be considered sexual harassment. 
Akatsu looked at her sternly and asked her to stay calm about that matter since he is gay and not interested in women. Our nervous protagonist reminded Akatsu that he could give the wrong impression to men with that comment. Akatsu told the protagonist that he could also relax since he's not his type, and he wouldn't be foolish enough to date someone from the organization. Sasaki offered Akatsu the pickled plums. Our protagonist was surprised to see that Akatsu was fascinated by the plums' taste, as it was the first time he had seen such an expression on someone like him. Akatsu commented that they were the best plums he had ever tasted. After this, Sasaki returned to his apartment feeling more tired than usual. He met Shizuka and she told him that he's coming home late. The protagonist didn't understand the comment, and she asked him if she could stay with him for the night. Sasaki asked for the reasons, and Shizuka showed him the microphone and the thermal camera, threatening that she knows Pai's secret, revealing that she had been spying on him without his knowledge and knows that the bird can talk. Sasaki realized that the thermal camera was fake, as both he and Pai would have detected it. Shizuka would talk to him about the envoys from the fairy world, who are creatures that sometimes visit the human world. Sasaki didn't understand what she meant and asked about the matter. Shizuka showed him a card, warning that if he didn't cooperate, she would reveal all the information to the organization's superiors. Our protagonist had already prepared a single attack to silence her. However, she clarified that it was a joke, as she could perceive Sasaki's intentions. She asked him if he doesn't neglect his own security, explaining that psychics in Japan hate magical girls. Even though he felt safe because of his agent status, he should be more careful from now on. Our protagonist realized that Shizuka believed the story that he's a magical man. He asked her what she wanted exactly. Shizuka tells him that her former criminal organization is chasing her. Sasaki commented that he understands the situation of being pursued, but clarifies that if he helps her, she might put herself in more danger than she already is. Shizuka tried to convince him with money, offering an economic deal. The protagonist decided to accept and commented that he would discuss the details tomorrow. He tried to go to his apartment, and Shizuka stopped him, asking if she could stay with him. The next day, Sasaki and Shizuka met, Pai introduced himself to her, and Sasaki himself asked how much money she was willing to offer. Here, it's explained that the protagonist told Pai about the situation, and the latter was tempted to accept the deal since he wanted to eat Kobe beef once a month. Pai approached Shizuka and asked her if she would oppose paying with something other than money. He mentioned that he knows how she has built her wealth and her connections among the wealthy people, so he asked her to share all those resources and wealth with them. Shizuka accepted this and asked Sasaki if he agreed. He would accept, however, as a condition. He requested to be kept away from anything that would bother their bosses. She agreed to the condition and asked if there was anything they wanted to sell, something that exists only in the fairy world. Pai told her there was an offered precious metals, referring to the otherworldly gold. Shizuka wanted to know if those minerals also existed in the human world. Pai confirmed this and asked why she wanted to know. She replied that if they brought something wrong or that attracted too much attention, it could have serious consequences. Although she didn't deny that she was interested in seeing how the world would react if they brought those wrong things. Pai said he would take care of bringing the minerals, and Sasaki warned that Akatsu would conduct the interview. Shizuka accepted Akatsu's call. The latter asked her to demonstrate that she truly wanted to join the organization, as he knew she was an officer of the enemy organization. He clarified that it had to be something of goodwill. Shizuka asked for a mission, and Akatsu explained that he couldn't give her full-time jobs, but he was willing to offer her a trial contract. She accepted this condition and asked what would happen if they start looking for her. Akatsu replied that Sasaki would be in charge of everything. This surprised the protagonist, and he quickly intervened in the call, reminding him that he was just a new employee. Akatsu told him that he knew, but his policy was to promote talented agents, regardless of how long they had been working for them. Nervously, Sasaki commented that he had no authority to protect Shizuka. Akatsu started laughing and clarified to the protagonist that he would have the same authority as Hashizaki from now on. He reminded him that the hierarchy within the organization doesn't work like in other state agencies. Sasaki would become even more nervous about how things could end, and Akatsu revealed that it was the first time he had promoted someone twice in their first weeks. Thus, the interview would end, and Sasaki took care of the rest. They both went to a bar to drink liquor. Shizuka asked the protagonist what he did with the plums. He commented that he hadn't used them yet but had shared them with his colleagues. Shizuka mentioned that surely his colleagues were delighted with the taste of real plums. The protagonist clarified that he didn't know if his colleagues liked the plums or not, but he was sure they had a strong flavor based on the facial expressions they made. 
then she thanked him for giving her the plum. Shizuka would understand why the organization trusted the protagonist so much and commented that he exuded too much honesty. Sasaki clarified that Akatsu focuses on the results and not on the rest. Here, he would tell Shizuka that he would hire her to work, even if she wasn't a permanent member of the organization. Shizuka says that from now on, she will spread rumors about starting to date an agent. Sasaki didn't like this, but he knew he couldn't get angry since he had entrusted her with her resources from the other world. Sasaki would ask her if she knows about the magical field of magical girls. Shizuka replies that that technique is what allows a magical girl to teleport. The protagonist comments that if something were to happen, with that technique, he could go and help her instantly. Hashizaki interrupted the conversation, mentioning that she heard about his promotion and being in charge of taking care of Shizuka. She asked both of them what they were doing in a bar together. The protagonist clarifies that it's all orders from Akatsu. Hashizaki mentions that Akatsu probably didn't consider that they would go drinking with Shizuka. Sasaki realized that he had done something wrong, but he wouldn't give it much importance now. Sasaki decided to invite Hashizaki to eat with them, and she agreed. Later, the protagonist came out of the bathroom and met alone with Hashizaki. She wanted to ask him a question, but Sasaki stopped her, asking if her psychic power allows her to control bodily fluids as well. Hashizaki affirmed this but could only do it if she touched someone's body. Sasaki fell silent, thinking of a way to control Shizuka. Hashizaki thanked the protagonist for saving her when the magical girl appeared. She offered him a gift as a reward, and Sasaki accepted and shared his gift with Shizuka. She would be the first to try the gift, which was plum tortillas. He did it to make sure they weren't poisoned, clarifying that her fate is now tied to his. Hashizaki was upset that the protagonist shared the gift with someone else, and Shizuka asked her if she was jealous of their friendly relationship with the protagonist. She would deny it somewhat embarrassed. In the other world, we see the king addressing his nobles, informing them that the country will face an unprecedented danger. He clarifies that the destruction of the Ojin Empire's forces is just one part of the impending war. As both the kingdom of Ojin and his own will face off in the future, he expresses his desire to secure the prosperity of his country and reclaim its former glory. To achieve this, he proposes a new policy. This policy entails granting those with a right to succession the ability to influence state affairs. He explains that in five years, the person who has contributed the most to this new policy will be declared heir to the throne of hers. This surprises the others, especially Mueller, who is concerned about Adma's safety, as anything could happen from now on. Meanwhile, Mark is walking through the village with another person, discussing the conflict between Ojin and hers. They are soon interrupted by a carriage, which attempts to run over Mark. Mark senses something amiss and manages to evade the carriage in time. A man exits the carriage and reprimands them, stating that they damaged Count Dietrich's carriage. Mark apologizes for the incident. The boy accompanying Mark realizes that the person inside the carriage is Director Herman and wonders what he is doing in the village. The scene shifts to Sasaki. He is checking his suitcase to ensure that all the transmitters, binoculars, and other items are there to sell to the nobility. Pai, on the other hand, is distractedly looking out the window, which strikes Sasaki as odd. He asks if something is wrong, but Pai refuses to answer and continues staring out the window. A maid enters Sasaki's room and delivers a message from Mueller. Both Pai and Sasaki exchange looks, and then head to the Viscount's territory, where they are greeted by nervous guards. Sasaki notices this and wonders if something serious has happened. In the meeting room, Mueller and Sasaki meet. Mueller thanks them both for coming and Sasaki asks why they are needed. Mueller explains that the king of hers has announced a new policy, causing a great uproar throughout the country, especially among the royalty and nobility. Sasaki thanks him for informing them of the matter and comments that both he and Pai are pleased to be kept up to date. Mueller explains that due to the conflict with Ojin, the king has questioned the future of hers and has granted power to all heirs. The king plans to choose an heir within five years based on who has contributed the most to the country. Pai mentions that when someone loses in a war, the royal family of the loser is often executed. So, he doesn't understand the need to question the future of hers and asks if something has happened with the king to make such a risky move. 
Miller agrees with this and clarifies that he knows nothing about it. Pai deduces that there must be someone who wants to seize the throne. Mueller reveals that most nobles support Louis as the future heir, while others support Adonis. Pai recognizes that internal conflict for the throne is inevitable and asks if similar situations have been occurring. Mueller tells him that internal conflicts between noble factions have recently intensified and there have already been casualties. Because of all this, he asks both of them to leave the kingdom and go to the Republic of Lunge. Sasaki is surprised by this, and Mueller explains that he shouldn't be telling them about this matter, let alone asking them to leave for their own well-being, so he asks them to keep everything secret from the king. He reveals that he has contacts in the Republic of Lunge and can ensure their safe passage there, wishing them success in this new beginning. These words positively impact Sasaki, as nobody had shown concern for him before. Sasaki declines the offer and decides to stay in the city, trading with the nobility as long as possible. He decides to show Mueller his suitcase with the merchandise he obtained from the human world. Mueller initially wants to refuse to buy the merchandise, as he wants both Sasaki and Pai to be safe. Pai stares at Mueller, indicating his support for Sasaki's decision. The Viscount thanks them both for staying and wants to inspect the merchandise. Suddenly, a noble enters the room to deliver an urgent message from Herman. Mueller is somewhat suspicious but decides to go and receive the message. The noble sat with them and mentioned that Mark had been imprisoned for insulting a noble. Sasaki asked what had happened exactly and he recounted that Mark had collided with Count Dietrich's carriage. The man who was with Mark at the time introduced himself and stated that Mark had done nothing wrong, affirming that it was all a setup to imprison him. Mueller thought the same and asked him to tell everything he saw. Sasaki summarized the entire conflict for us, explaining that Herman had struck deals with Dietrich to expand their businesses to other parts of the world, aiming to amass more wealth to distribute between them. However, when Herman arrived in hers to expand their businesses, he was surprised to find Mark surpassing him, which stirred envy and nerves in him. If he allowed himself to be surpassed in business by Mark, his reputation would be ruined. To prevent this, he set a trap to remove Mark from the path. He achieved this with Dietrich's help, who happens to be Mueller's eternal rival. Both Dietrich and Herman made sure to imprison Mark and devised a complex plan to get rid of him legally. Sasaki knew that Dietrich was secretly planning a coup because he knew that due to him, the steward betrayed Mueller's family and nearly killed the Viscount and Adonis. Sasaki informed Mueller that he would visit Mark in jail. The Viscount decided to give Sasaki a dagger, telling him that if he showed it and mentioned his name, his words would carry the same weight as any other noble. Sasaki thanked Mueller for the dagger and decided to go save Mark. Later, we see Pai and Sasaki going over everything they discussed about a possible conspiracy in hers. Pai offered Sasaki the opportunity to lend his magic in case they had to intervene to stop the conflict. He accepted the offer, stating that he would use it in case of emergency. He took the chance to ask Pai to let him handle the whole matter alone. Pai asked him if he had a plan to do everything alone. Sasaki explained that he wasn't doing it because he had a plan, but because he wanted to resolve the conflict politically and without resorting to violence. In the jail, Sasaki was greeted by a guard who warned him to be careful as Count Dietrich's knights were watching Mark at all times. Sasaki was escorted to Mark's cell. Mark asked him why he was visiting him. Sasaki apologized for rescuing him so late and used his magic to heal Mark's wounds. One of the guards, who worked for Dietrich, became alarmed and threatened to execute Sasaki on the spot for using magic, but he ignored them. He mentioned that he knew everything that had happened and was willing to prove Mark's innocence against Dietrich's accusations. Sasaki used the guards who threatened him to send a direct message to Dietrich. He mentioned that he already knew about his conspiracy and alliance with Herman, warning him to be careful with his decisions and not to involve civilians in their affairs. 
The guard was slightly surprised by this, but decided to deliver the message and asked if Sasaki was indeed the one he had heard rumors about, a foreign merchant who was very close to Adonis and served as his bodyguard. Sasaki clarified to the guard that he was more interested in Mark's life than Adonis's, as he was interested in business. The guard threatened to execute Sasaki for speaking that way about a noble, and Sasaki asked him to get permission from Adonis to do so. After this, Sasaki visited Joseph and asked for permission to open a trading company in hers, mentioning that he also needed investors interested in his business. Joseph asked if he really wanted a company, to which Sasaki replied affirmatively, expressing his trust in Joseph to obtain the necessary permits and paperwork. Joseph wanted to know why he was so confident about founding a company, and Sasaki showed him all his merchandise. Joseph said he could support him in founding his company, but warned that they could both get into trouble with the nobility. Sasaki acknowledged that it could be dangerous, but managed to convince him that he would keep him safe and wouldn't cause trouble with the nobility. Joseph decided to believe him and asked for the name of the future company. Sasaki said he would name the company after Mark. After this meeting, Pai and Sasaki had lunch on a hill to discuss the matter. Pai advised Sasaki to start by gathering gold as a method of payment for his company, explaining that with the gold he obtained from the other world, he could transfer it to the human world and thus get more money. Although he clarifies that he doesn't advise this so much for the money, but to help his own country, revealing that he researched on the internet about Japan and found out that they are scarce in gold and believes that it would be a good idea to transfer the gold to the human world. Sasaki decided to leave Pai in charge of all the transportation and money conversion. Pai agreed to help him and left. Sasaki, on his part, took care of gathering all the gold. At sunset, Sasaki had managed to obtain several boxes to put the gold he was going to transport in. He was waiting for Pai to appear to use the teleportation spell, but a maid interrupted Sasaki to tell him that he had visitors. It was Elsa. She had heard about the situation with Mark and wanted to ask Sasaki about it. Sasaki reassured her by telling her that both Mueller and he were doing everything possible to prove Mark's innocence. She asked him if he thinks Mark will return safely. Upon hearing this, Sasaki understood that the situation was much more serious than it seemed and feared a bit for Mark's safety. He decided to appear confident in front of Elsa and promised her that he would bring Mark back alive. She was relieved by his words. Their conversation would be interrupted by Pai, who would appear with his teleportation spell. The three of them were horrified by the situation. Elsa was surprised that Pai could use magic, while Sasaki was scared of being discovered by mistake. Elsa asked Sasaki about Pai's identity. He didn't know what to answer, and was thinking about how to get out of the situation without revealing who they were. In the end, they had no choice but to tell Elsa the truth, and Pai himself would introduce himself. Sasaki would tell Elsa that Pai is his pet and comes from a special race that can speak and use high-level magic. He asked her to keep Pai's identity a secret, as only Mueller knew the truth, and if this information came to light, they would be forced to leave the country. Elsa promised both of them that she wouldn't betray them and made an oath with Pai clasping her fingers with his. Elsa said goodbye to both of them, and Sasaki took the opportunity to transport the gold to the human world. They both appeared in a warehouse and transported the boxes on an industrial scale. This surprised Shizuka, as she didn't expect Sasaki to bring quite a bit of merchandise. Shizuka decided to check if the gold was pure and ended up discovering that Elsa was in one of the boxes. Both Sasaki and Pai were frightened by this, as things could go wrong if Elsa or Shizuka discovered the problems of both worlds. If we see all the civilians and friends of Sasaki in the afterlife searching for Elsa. They gathered at the same point to discuss where she might be. Mueller was part of this investigation and was worried about Elsa's disappearance, believing she might have been kidnapped. We switch scenes, and Shizuka would ask Sasaki if there are humans in the fairy world as well. Shizuka would carefully analyze Elsa, realizing that her attire had too many details to be a costume, 
not to mention the golden ornaments it had. She wondered if those ornaments could be real. Elsa was a bit uncomfortable with the situation and was afraid of Shizuka. She would look at Sasaki and ask for context of the situation. Sasaki would apologize to Shizuka and asked her to leave him alone with Elsa. She refused, asking why he was so uncomfortable with her meeting Elsa. Sasaki didn't know what to say, and Shizuka decided to stay, stating she would like to hear Elsa's words coming from the fairy world. Sasaki tried to explain that it's a very delicate matter. Shizuka understood this and decided to leave them alone. Sasaki wondered what he should do now in that situation, knowing that both Elsa and Shizuka would want to meet each other. He was also afraid to speak, knowing that if he talked too much about the other world, his lie about being a magical being would be revealed. He thought of a good excuse since he was aware that Shizuka is very intelligent, recognized by Hoshizaki herself. Pai reassured Sasaki, revealing to him that Shizuka couldn't understand the language of the other world. This surprised Sasaki, and Pai explained that his magic filtered his words, making them incomprehensible to others. Because of this filtering magic, he could communicate with people from the other world. However, it only works with him, as Shizuka would only hear an unknown language, and the same would happen in reverse. In short, neither Elsa nor Shizuka can understand each other. With this information, Sasaki deduced that Shizuka wouldn't know about Elsa's world, making it easier for him to deceive her. Sasaki asked Elsa to explain how she ended up in the box. She decided to tell her story, and Sasaki was surprised. Elsa believed that because of her, Mark had gone to prison. She had the idea that she sold Mark to Count Dietrich in exchange for gold. Sasaki understood this and mentioned that in a way, she betrayed Mark for gold, but he clarified that taking the gold to another world is necessary to save him. Elsa asked for explanations, and Sasaki told her that his intention is to use the gold to gain benefits with Shizuka's help and thus be able to return to clear Mark's name. Elsa asked if this was true, which Sasaki affirmed, but he warned her that with her presence in this world, she had made Shizuka doubt him. She felt a little guilty about this, and Sasaki tried to cheer her up, clarifying that he would never betray Mueller and certainly wouldn't abandon Mark to his fate. Elsa asked if she could really trust him, and Sasaki decided to make an oath. But he was interrupted when Shizuka attacked Elsa. Pai reacted in time and cornered Shizuka with powerful gusts of wind, causing her harm. He asked her what her intention was in attacking Elsa. Shizuka realized that her blood was beginning to be absorbed by Pai's magic and wondered if it was part of the fairy's abilities. Elsa was frightened by the matter and asked Sasaki about Shizuka's intentions. Sasaki was equally confused as Elsa but remained alert. He himself would ask Shizuka what she was trying to do, and Shizuka mentioned that Elsa had a bug on her shoulder. Pai threatened her, saying he didn't mind getting rid of her right away. After this, Pai cursed Shizuka. She looked at her hand, seeing several scribbles in a language she didn't understand. Pai explained that every time she felt hostility or malice towards any of them, that mark would occupy more skin. Even if she only had it on one hand, this mark would spread throughout her entire body, and when her whole body was covered with the marks, she would be reduced to a lump of flesh. He clarified that no regenerative power could save her from that curse, as her entire body would be completely destroyed. He advised her that if she didn't want to end up eternally powerless and incapable of thinking, she should start by getting rid of any ill intentions she had towards them. Shizuka wouldn't hesitate to attack Elsa again, and Sasaki prevented this by creating a magical barrier. Shizuka crashed into the barrier and realized that the mark had spread across her body. Shizuka decided to stop fighting and mentioned that she only wanted to find a weakness in the curse. Sasaki would take advantage of Shizuka's attitude to ask Elsa to return to her world since she was in a very dangerous place. Elsa refused this, saying she has many questions to ask. Sasaki promised to tell her everything when they were at the castle, but she refused, insisting she wanted answers right now. Sasaki thought carefully about this. 
If he revealed too much information, it could affect his relationship with Mueller and even ruin his ties with the other world. He asked what he could do to make her trust him, and Elsa thought for a moment. Sasaki offered her the opportunity to tour his world so she could get to know it a little. She agreed and traveled on a cruise with Sasaki. She was fascinated by the city's buildings and asked if he truly originated from such an advanced world, which Sasaki confirmed. Sasaki asked her if she believed him now. Elsa, with some pride, told him that she did. After all, nothing in hers resembled the city they were in. Sasaki thanked her for believing him. Elsa approached him and asked why he visited the other world deducing that he must be looking for something valuable, because she didn't believe someone from such a prosperous world would want to go to hers. Sasaki pondered this question and answered that he only seeks harmony between both worlds. Shizuka intervened in the conversation, saying she wanted to be part of it. Meanwhile, he would show Shizuka everything about the city. The day was a bit busy for Sasaki and Shizuka, as they had to protect Elsa and teach her everything about the human world. Sasaki decided to take Elsa out to eat. She loved the taste of human food and began asking several questions about the recipe. Soon, both Shizuka and Sasaki realized they were near several journalists who were trying to record the cruise. A reporter approached Elsa to ask her a couple of questions about the cruise, and Sasaki intervened, trying not to expose Elsa's identity. She noticed that a child was about to have an accident and didn't hesitate to use magic, managing to levitate the child to prevent him from getting hurt. This was recorded by the journalists, and Sasaki gave Shizuka permission to silence anyone who saw the scene. Quickly, Sasaki would take Elsa away and ask Shizuka to try to divert the attention of any psychics who might be looking for Elsa. Before they could escape, they were surrounded by some agents and drones. Shizuka deduced that there must be spy drones that had been watching them for a while. The group had no choice but to go to the agency's offices and meet with Akistu. Sasaki tried to explain the situation, but Akistu ignored this and asked to speak to him alone. Shizuka decided to help Sasaki by passing Elsa off as her foreign friend. Akistu decided to believe them and asked Shizuka for information about her former criminal organization, explaining that a B-ranked psychic capable of large-scale telekinesis had just appeared. These appearances led to the said psychic intercepting an agency mission last week. Shizuka asked what was happening with that psychic. Seeing that she wasn't willing to give him information, Akistu asked her to neutralize the psychic. Sasaki reflected on this as he didn't want Shizuka to end up dealing with a former colleague. Suddenly, Akistu asked Sasaki to accompany Shizuka on the mission. Despite his efforts, he had no choice but to accept the mission. Later, we see Elsa and Sasaki having tea inside an apartment. Elsa seemed irritated by the situation and didn't hesitate to hit the table. This scared Sasaki, and he asked if there was a problem. She told him she wanted to know more about his world. He asked her why her interest, and Elsa commented that she wants to learn everything and then take that knowledge to hers, because that way, she feels she can help Mueller, her father. She reveals that women in hers don't stand out much and mostly are just used as a kind of object for marriage due to political or social reasons, but she wanted to change that. Sasaki refused to show her more about his world. Elsa promised him that she wouldn't tell anything about what she saw in hers in that case, saying it shouldn't be too difficult for him to keep a girl. However, Sasaki commented that actually, he would have many difficulties if he decides to take care of her in his world. He told her that in his country, every person has an identification number and is controlled very thoroughly. Because she comes from another world, she doesn't have any identification number in his country, coupled with her features making her look foreign. She could get in trouble with the police and end up in jail for entering a country illegally. If something like that were to happen, he would feel so disappointed in himself that he wouldn't be able to face Mueller. These words surprised Elsa a bit, and she holds on to the idea that it is necessary to explore his world to understand it. 
arguing that if for some reason both worlds were to go to war, hers wouldn't stand a chance, and she wanted at least to ensure that her world would be safe from such a threat. Sasaki assured her that wouldn't be necessary. Elsa wanted to know why he thought this, and he explained that hers isn't as weak as she believes compared to the human world. Pai supported Sasaki in the discussion and told Elsa that most of the humans' weapons are based on heat and impact. This makes their operation limited by time and cost. Therefore, if any barrier spell were used, they could neutralize any human weapon. So it's impossible for humans to conquer hers, at least not in the short term. Elsa was surprised by this, and Pai assured her that hers is actually a much more versatile world than the human one. This frightened Sasaki a bit because he thought of the possibility that hers might decide to invade Earth, and if that were to happen, his world would be in danger. He knows he can't allow this because he has many people he cares about in the city, and he didn't want them to die. Elsa was surprised to see Sasaki's face, which was of profound terror exploring the possibilities. She asked him why he was making that face, and Sasaki revealed to her that Earth is his home so he's also afraid of a war. Elsa asked him not to think about that again, as she felt an aura that gave her chills. After that, Pai recommended her to return to hers with Mueller, as he is probably very worried about her sudden disappearance, and he offered to calm Mueller's anger. Elsa was relieved to know that Pai would accompany her, and Sasaki decided to use the teleportation spell to travel with them to hers. We if see French walking through a dungeon at Sasaki's request, who had given him a dagger and a box to deliver to Mark. After a while of walking, he finally reached Mark's cell and gave him something to eat. French couldn't help but feel sad seeing Mark so physically deteriorated. The next day, Sasaki met with Mueller in his office, and Elsa apologized to Mueller for having escaped for so long. Mueller was relieved to see Elsa and didn't hesitate to embrace her. Then he apologized to Sasaki for causing so many problems by neglecting Elsa and allowing her to follow him. Sasaki, somewhat nervous, tried to convince him that he hadn't had any problems with Elsa and that everything was fine. Pai supported Sasaki's words, confessing that it was his fault for not being attentive. Sasaki took the opportunity to ask Mueller if there were any developments regarding Mark's case. Mueller told him that he had tried to meet with Count Dietrich, but had been unsuccessful. Sasaki was saddened by this, and a servant entered the room, informing Mueller that visitors had arrived. He decided to handle the matter, and Elsa couldn't help but follow them and try to eavesdrop on the conversation. She would be discovered by one of his servants, who asked her not to disappear again. Sasaki and Mueller were with Herman, whom they hadn't seen for a long time. Herman decided to talk about Mark, saying that, as a representative of the company he works for, he wants to apologize for all the problems caused by Mark's case. Both asked him not to worry and promised they would find a way to save him. Herman was saddened to hear this and told them that he had heard rumors that Count Dietrich had sentenced Mark to be executed very soon. This surprised Sasaki and Muller, who began to doubt the matter and decided to intervene seriously. Herman asked them not to try anything about it, affirming that he didn't want to cause more problems for the nobility because of Mark's case and clarified that Count Dietrich was acting in his own interest. Mueller seemed upset by the matter, and Herman recommended that he let Mark die, as there was nothing to be done with the dictated sentence. After this conversation, Herman left in his carriage. Pai commented that Herman is a traitor, evident from his poor handling of Mark's situation. Sasaki told him that both he and Mueller had realized it, but they had to do something to prevent Mark's execution. Mueller offered to speak with Count Dietrich in person. Pai asked if he had a plan in mind, and Muller explained that his original idea was to pay for a trial for Mark to prove his innocence, but since the matter had escalated too quickly, he had no other option. Sasaki analyzed the situation, believing that Herman's betrayal was because he sought to move his company to the capital with Count Dietrich's help. He soon realized something and asked Muller if the Count had tried to take the house away from him before. 
Mueller decided to tell him that Dietrich is an exceptional politician, one of the best in the country in internal affairs, and never rests until he achieves his goal. Sasaki asked if he hadn't noticed a pattern in all the things that had been happening. Mueller told him that he had, revealing that both his lineage and Dietrich's had been at odds for generations because in the past, they fought for territory. He deduced that Dietrich was probably using Herman as a means to steal resources. Sasaki asked Mueller if he could accompany him to his meeting with Dietrich. Later, the three went to Dietrich's territory. Pai asked Sasaki why he wanted to meet with him. Sasaki explained that he wanted to meet Dietrich in person to get an idea of his modus operandi and know how to counter his plans. Pai wasn't entirely in agreement with this, saying that meeting with Dietrich could be a bad idea. Sasaki replied that the difference was that he couldn't resolve things as quickly as Pai. After a few hours, the group arrived at Dietrich's offices. Dietrich told Mueller that regardless of what he had to say, he would execute Mark anyway, as it was an act that couldn't be easily annulled. Sasaki analyzed Dietrich's behavior, feeling an intense aura of hostility that reminded him of his former boss. Dietrich looked at Sasaki and asked about his identity. He introduced himself as a merchant. Dietrich recognized him, as he knew that Sasaki was involved in Adonis's return. Sasaki took the opportunity to offer him a walkie-talkie, saying it was an offering from him to try to improve relations. Dietrich was surprised to see the walkie-talkie and asked how it worked. Sasaki explained that it's a device used to communicate remotely with other people. This surprised Dietrich, who commented that he had heard about Sasaki's merchandise, which is considered of high quality and quite peculiar, all made of a metallic material to make them work. Sasaki affirmed all this and told him that he had been supplying merchandise to Herman, which made Dietrich doubt. He asked Mueller if he usually trades with Herman, which Mueller confirmed. Dietrich asked if he was trying to negotiate Mark's life. Sasaki told him that Mark is important for the trade of his products and he needs him alive. Dietrich decided to make a deal with Sasaki, telling him that from now on, he would buy all his products, and in exchange, he would release Mark. Mueller intervened in this, commenting that Sasaki is just one of Mark's clients and is not willing to involve him in political matters. Dietrich threatened him, saying that if that's the case, he wouldn't hesitate to execute Mark as planned. Sasaki asked for time to think about the offer, which surprised Mueller. Dietrich accepted his proposal and clarified that the execution would be delayed for a month. After the meeting, Mueller apologized to Sasaki for involving him in a rather complicated political matter. He couldn't help but worry about his business. Sasaki reminded him that the goal of all this is to save Mark's life, and what he just did was to buy time. Just then, French appeared and asked Sasaki if the rumors about Mark's execution are true. This surprised him, and he wanted to know how he found out. French revealed that the dungeon guard had told him about the execution. Sasaki came up with an idea and asked Mueller to try to extend the execution for another two or three weeks. Mueller agreed to this and asked if he had a plan in mind, which Sasaki affirmed, clarifying that he is willing to do whatever it takes to save Mark, and besides that, he needs a favor from him. Mueller agreed to help him and left in his carriage. Pai asked Sasaki about his plan, reminding him that they could resort to violence at any time to resolve everything. Sasaki told him that violence would be the last resort if his plan fails, then asked Pai if he could teach him the flying spell, to which Pai agreed. That night, Dietrich told Herman that he had delayed Mark's execution trusting that Sasaki would accept his offer since he recognized him as a good merchant who could make many profits that would benefit Prince Louis, Adonis' rival. The next day, Sasaki arrived in the village dragging a box with the help of the servant Mary. He decided to pay the servant to keep his actions secret. She accepted the payment and left. Pai, a bit doubtful about the matter, asked Sasaki if what he was about to do involved escaping from the city. Sasaki told him he didn't plan to do something like that. 
Senpai clarified that it was just a joke and asked what he planned to do with the reserve merchandise. Sasaki asked him to try to talk to Joseph to get money since it was an important part of his plan. Pai contacted Joseph, and they both met at a warehouse. Sasaki offered him all his merchandise and asked for a loan. In exchange, he would offer him double the merchandise they had agreed on. He agreed, and Mattis intervened in the conversation. Joseph introduced him to Mattis, who was his companion and friend during his student days, who currently works at the central bank. Mattis told Joseph that a noble from hers asked for a higher than usual loan and needed his advice. Sasaki realized that Mattis was the same banker who serves Count Dietrich, decided to join the conversation and asked for more information about it. In the human world, we see Adonati worried that Sasaki hasn't come home for several days. She thought he must be working late again. However, she heard strange noises from Sasaki's room. This surprised her, as she had been waiting for him since he returned to classes and wondered how it was possible for Sasaki to return without her noticing. She thought he might be sick. She approached the door to try to listen to the conversation, discovering that Sasaki was with someone. Soon, she was discovered by Sasaki himself, who greeted her. Adonari bid him good night and asked if he planned to go out, which Sasaki confirmed. Pai stared at Adonari, beginning to suspect her. Sasaki said goodbye to Adonari and quickly left the place. Out of nowhere, he received a message from Shizuka, who told him that all the merchandise was ready and the money was prepared. Later, in the other world, Mueller would return to Elsa and tell her that everything regarding Mark was going well. In the dungeon, French would give Mark a little more food and tell him to hold on a little longer, revealing that Sasaki would soon get him out. Several weeks later, Herman met with Dietrich to tell him that Sasaki would not accept the offer. However, Dietrich ignored him and asked about the loan he had made to the central bank. Herman was surprised that he found out and explained that all that money was to relocate his business branch but Dietrich commented that the loan amount was too high for a simple relocation. In that same meeting, Dietrich received a letter and couldn't help but smirk maliciously as he read it. If you've reached this part of the video, comment the word bird in the comments. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of this anime.